Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be here today with Terry Trespicio. I actually heard of Terry for years before I actually met her. And then when I met her, I was like, you and I need to talk a lot more, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I invited her to come talk to me today. She is an award winning writer, speaker, and brand advisor. And her TEDx talk, Stop Searching for Your Passion, I checked the numbers a couple of days ago, has almost 8 million views. And HubSpot named her one of the top 18 feel female speakers who are killing it. So today we're going to learn about how she does that. She's a former magazine editor and radio host at Martha Stewart, and she has appeared on The Today Show, Dr. Oz, The Early Show, The Anderson Cooper Show, as well as Oprah Magazine, Inc.com, and Business Insider. She's also been a stand-up comedian, which is one of the things, uh, in, if I were an, had different DNA and had a different life, I would love to do. <laughs> and she's a certified facilitator in the Gateless Writing Method. Her new book, Unfollow Your Passion, subtitle, How to Create a Life That Really How to Create a Life That Matters to You, is an incredible book. And I feel like it's my smartest best friend, the kind of person I'd want to call at three in the morning. It is the just such wise advice on making a meaningful life. I have really, really enjoyed it. And I highly, highly recommend it. And what's so interesting to me about it is that so much of the wisdom in it applies to public speaking. Not surprising, because Terry is an incredible speaker, performer, et cetera. So we're kind of going to dig into that today. So Terry, welcome. I'm thank so you. happy to see you. What a warm and lovely introduction. And thank you. That was my uh, fun fact. I did not set out to write a self-help title. But the publisher said, well, you will be if you want to work with us. And I said, okay. And so I kind of took the stories that I wanted to share and turned them into that. But it means a lot to me that you say that because, of course, there's a lot of books out there telling you how to live your life. And I wanted this to feel different. Where I want to start today, though, is with your TEDx talk, the one Stop Searching for Your Passion, because you do something the moment you walk on that stage, I mean, I think it actually starts probably the moment before you walk on that stage, that I try to do when I am up there, I help my clients try to do when they're up there, that I feel is very, very hard to do. And I, I want to tell you what it was, and then I want to see if you know you can think about, what did I do to do that? What you do is, well, let me back up. When it's not working or not working as well as it can, you know how there's that minute or two after you get up on the stage where it takes you time to settle? Yeah. And you can almost see it in somebody where yes. it's like, it's a minute in, two minutes in, and boom, you're like, oh, they just landed. And now yes. they're in the flow, right? That's right. And that can happen to any, you know, it happens to the best of us, no matter like how many downward dogs we do, how much breathing, whatever. What you do when that TEDx starts is, is it's as if you were at the kitchen table chopping and then somebody said, what was that story about such and such? And you turn and go, you know, I was in the elevator going down and you just, it's like you're in it when you start. So relaxed, so present, so there. So what I want to ask you is how do you, how do you do that? Well, this is now years ago too. I mean, this is going on eight years since I gave that mm. talk. And I was, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking since then, and I had done some before then too, but I've certainly gotten uh, more relaxed. And um, I like to feel like I'm loose as a goose up there. And I'll tell you that day, I was not relaxed, not even in the least bit, because this was one of the very rare times when I memorized it word for word, because there I knew we were dealing with a very short window of time and I didn't have time to fumble. So I memorized it, but I had only finished writing it very soon before. So I was like, this is your job. Just give the talk and give it as you've been giving it and giving it to yourself. But it's funny that you comment on the first moment because the other person, someone else commented on that. And I think it might have been Seth Godin, who I had the pleasure of meeting at an event. Um, and he said, you walk out and you, there's a moment. And I think it was unconscious. I think I was nervous and I needed to just take a minute. And I think every speaker should only because they'll wait. 
right? And that moment of silence. But the thing that I consider my strong suit on stage is that I go into it and I treat the audience as if they are my friends. Uh, and I think of it, what I I was like, how do I? People say, oh, you, you're just so confident or you're so relaxed. I wasn't relaxed. And I, I'm just as, you know, missing confidence as anyone else when you're up for a big thing like that. But what I've realized what I do, and this is what I've tried to practice ever since and tell, teach speakers to do, is trust first. You don't have time to have them earn your trust. You can't go out there defensive. And also, people who show up to a live TED event are like usually a bunch of sweet, smart people. Like no one's going there to heckle you, you know? And so I was like, trust that they're here for the best reason and I'm here for the best reason. And that if you give them something to think about today, great. Uh, but I will tell you, Gigi, that when I walked out of there, I was like, oh, that was fun. Like, I didn't think it would ever see the light of day again. I said, that was a wonderful experience. I'm so glad I did it. My mom's going to be so proud. And it wasn't for a couple more weeks and then months that all of a sudden it, it ticked up and it started getting, uh, and that's something, it started getting more and more views. And that's something you can't plan for. And I certainly almost had, you know, no hand in that. Well, it's, it's a beautiful first moment, but I love that lesson about trusting first, you know, because if the audience feels like you're coming in, then they come in. But if you are up there waiting for them to come in, it's never oh, going to no. happen. You know, you and a lot of people do first. come out like this. And because I did a little stand-up comedy, I never paid my rent with it, I promise you. Didn't really earn a dime, but I loved doing it and practicing that as a skill. But a lot of comics go out and be like, this audience stinks. Like they, they would say other words, but they're like, this audience is terrible. And I was like, you're going out there hating the audience? Like, no wonder they don't like you. And I was like, I such an, you know, they would blame the audience when really their craft just wasn't as good. You have to assume that someone's going to know good stuff when they hear it. So let me ask you one thing about the memorizing. Because most people I coach would have a hard time memorizing it because it would sound memorized. And I disagree. you didn't sound memorized up there. No, nope. I all. think no. And I don't memorize typically. I've only done that a few times in my life. Very few. Right. But, but that was the time, obviously, because the time was so limited, you had to. But how did you make it sound like it wasn't memorized? Yes, this goes to the point about people saying they don't want to practice too much because they don't want to be over rehearsed. Right. And I always say, "Do you ever go see Hamilton? You ever see uh, a, a you know a, a big show on Broadway? Do you think that they don't rehearse because they don't want to sound over rehearsed? No, they're rehearsed. The difference to me, and I, you can disagree. Everyone teach every teacher has their own take on this, but I believe that memorizing is just deciding to do the heavy lifting first. When I go out now with slides and a keynote, and I know the material, I'm a little looser with it. I'm not under the same time constraints that I can get up there and I'll look at the slide and be able to talk about because I've talked about it. But if I don't prepare, then my heavy lifting is happening in front of the audience. And I say, no, when you memorize it, uh, the, the problem is memorizing and delivery are not the same thing. Another person who memorizes word for word is Elizabeth Gilbert. She is terrified of speaking and she memorizes it word for word. She said she does it so she can be ironing and doing the talk and doing the talk. And when you watch her, she's just talking. I think of it as a squirrel. You pack all the words in your face and you just memorize them all. And then you have them. You can actually relax more because you know you know it. The challenge of delivering, there's a lot of people who don't memorize who also sound not real relaxed up there. But when I know it, I can actually take more liberties with the delivery. The same reason that I say most people, when they're reading, you know they're reading. Da 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 da. They go very evenly, just like the words are on the page. I could read something to you right now, and you'd think I was making it up because I make it uneven the way normal human speech would be. So it takes a higher, more practice skill set to make something sound natural. But Gigi, I, I, I'm wondering if you agree. Not rehearsing doesn't make you necessarily better. No, it doesn't. Material. Yeah, yeah, especially with something like this. But you know what it is? It's the making it uneven. It's the making times it sound like you you're discovering it in the moment. Right, exactly. And that takes some, you know, that to me, that takes some acting skill. One acting teacher I had, what he would advise his actors to do was 
he would have them have a normal conversation. And then as soon as they started to sound like they were memorizing, he'd go, stop. What did you have for breakfast this morning? And they'd say, oh, I had cereal. I go, that's the voice I want. That's right. Not the, not, not the memorized voice. Right? Oh my gosh. Yes. In fact, when I, I do these, I, I do them a few times a year, like a program, right? And I'll have people do, we do a virtual speaker showcase. So you're sitting here in front of your computer. You can have your notes up. You can have the whole talk up there. And I say, it is deadly. The minute you go like that, you know, look down and start reading. I go, they know. They know. You can look down and then look back up and say the, say the line and do it because the, the energy goes out of the voice everything changes. And it is acting in a way, right? Actors aren't like, well, I'll just make it up. That'll be more natural. You actually have to, it is a performance art. So what I'll say to people, same thing. They, they overwrite it. It's overwritten. It's so awkward. They're using phrasing. They would never, would never come out of their mouth. And I'll say, that was so great, uh, Danielle. Could you um, do it again? Uh, no, I'll say, hey, can you just explain to me what happened in that scene? Because I, I don't know that I'm getting it. Can you just explain that part? And they'll go, oh, well, what happened was blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's it. You just did it. So they they get into speaking and reading mode and they don't fall into their body enough. But they do when you ask them to explain it. So that's the trick. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's perfect. It's, it's tricking them to get out of that kind of robot mode. Same thing as you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Let's dive into the book a little bit. And again, it's Unfollow Your Passion. I want to look at chapter two. Oh where my God, everyone grab your missiles. Chapter, grab your missiles. Turn to page. <laughs> <laughs> is why, why you can stay in your comfort zone. And I just laughed out loud when I read the chapter. Just because, oh. you know, I think what happens sometimes is, of course, it's good to learn to be uncomfortable because so much of life is, is you can't, you can't control it. But if that's not like the rule to follow, it doesn't mean you're doing a good job at life if you're uncomfortable right. 100% of the time, right? It's, it's not a rule to be followed. So you have tips for staying in your comfort zone that I think so apply to the zone you want to be in as a public speaker. So for example, yes. the first one was define it. And so how I translated that for me is, okay, I'm getting ready to speak. What's my comfort zone? What do I need on that stage to be my best self? I might need a stool. I need a glass of water. Mm -hmm. I need you to leave me alone for five minutes. Right, right, right. Want. You know, whatever it is. And so um, I'm just wondering if you have, you know, thinking about these in terms of public speaking. I mean, I have, I have examples for all of them because I think this list is so great. But um, I'm just wondering how you would translate this idea of being in the comfort yes. zone to somebody who's getting ready to speak. It's such an interesting parallel. I've never had anyone make that comparison or apply it in that way, but it absolutely works. My real issue with this as a topic is that I believe it's a real privilege to get to seek out discomfort when most of us and most of people throughout human history have been uncomfortable most of the time. And so this idea of like, ooh, this kind of bravado of like, I do something every day that scares me. Public speaking is pretty scary, even when you like it. So I'm not saying, well, get really comfortable is just get in bed and don't do anything. Obviously not. There's going to be some discomfort, but we don't need to aim for it. We can just say, this is what it takes to expand my comfort zone so that I can have more stuff in it. And so with thinking about what you need, I'll tell you what I need is for speaking. I have now, of course, learned the hard way of some of these things. Um, I never fly or travel the day I'm speaking right? Never. You go the night before. They have to cover it. That's it. Because that panic that you have if the flight's like, you can't, just can't live like that. I must get a good night's sleep. I must have protein that morning. I, you know, there's, I don't uh, think that this discomfort associated with, oh, I'm grinding it out and I'm suffering for it. I don't, you don't get a trophy for that. So when I get up there, I'm going to have rested, eaten, had a shower. I am ready. This is an instrument. When you're a speaker, right, your body is the instrument and you must take care of it. You don't see an orchestral uh, performer banging their cello around, being like, whatever, I'll, it'll sound fine. It's like, they treat that like gold. Why don't we do that for ourselves? Um, and I never get on stage without water because I that's one tick I have is I get I dry right out and I am in a panic that I won't be able to swallow and all that. So I just make sure I have those things. 
those are the things that we need. I'm not exactly super high maintenance. I just, this is, you must define what you need to do your best. And for some people, it's like, I need three cups of coffee. My, my friend needs beta blockers. She took beta blockers. They work for her. She performed. She had never spoken in front of a group of a couple hundred people, and she just did it at a conference. And she knows she, she gets incredible anxiety, but she was so excited about it. She didn't want her body interfering. So she got beta blockers. They're not for everyone, especially if you have low blood pressure, you'll pass out up there. Um, but I think we have to take that into account, all those things. That's great. I love that. I mean, your body, you know, sometimes I say your mind created the content and now your body needs to deliver it. And yes. so it needs to be, you know, working 110%. I, that's, speaking that's so great. is a physical act. You're a performer. It, it yeah. requires yeah. that. Yeah, that's great. Well, further down on that list is the one about lean into what you're good at. And what that reminded me of is often when clients come to see me, they're obsessing about something. Like, I think there's something weird about my voice, or I think <laughs> I do weird things with my hands or whatever. Never, never has that thing. When I've seen it, I'm going, oh, it's fine. You sound fine. <laughs> they get fine. hung up. They get hung up. But it's, but it's something else. <laughs> You know, there's always something else that they're not seeing that we can tweak. But the thing about lean into what you're good at is I find that don't obsess about these things that probably don't matter at all. You know what I mean? And um, I always will find the one thing that somebody's good at so that that's what they like. What am I? I'm, I'm trying. I'm getting a little a little mixed up here in what I'm trying to say exactly. But I think you need to go out on the stage knowing that I know this story. I'm good at that. Like labeling the things you're good at and not worrying about, oh, does my voice sound weird? Am I doing weird things with my hands? All this other stuff. And so I just love that. You know that when people are self-conscious about their performance, their appearance, whatever, they'll tell you the reasons why they think they're not acceptable or good. And like you said, it's their voice, it's their outfit, it's the, uh, the gestures, whatever. And it's rarely and usually never that thing. But what all of that presumes is that the audience actually cares about you. And the biggest breakthrough for me, for really being all there, all present when I'm speaking is, realizing that no one cares. It's a, am I weird about these shoes, about this outfit? No one cares. Do, did I forget mascara and I'm going out there with that mascara? No one cares. Is it not a great hair day? Ask anyone what your hair looked like that day in exchange for a million dollars and no one will walk out a million dollars richer. It's not going to happen. And when I realized that being up there, I could actually disappear into the message because they're there for them. They are looking for themselves in what you say. And I realized, my God, the most fun is I'm up there with an invisibility cloak on because the, I might check my lipstick before I go up. When I'm out there, it's gone. It all vanishes. All sense of myself vanishes and I encourage myself to go away like that. And that is why I find speaking to be such an interesting and exciting experience. I'll be more self-conscious tonight when I walk into this event I'm going to without knowing if I know people there. I'll be, I'll be a little more anxious about that than I am going out on stage. And so when in doubt, remember, no one actually cares. They're looking for themselves. And then you can just relax. Well, let's take a little skip now to chapter, let's see, what chapter number is? 17. Tell your critic to STFU so you can get some work done. Oh boy, that critic. Now, wow. Talk about how this, how this relates to public speaking. <laughs> So what I want to do is that inner critic can really come up. I, I find before for sure, during for sure, which can really, really? Be a freak out. <laughs> you think about it during your talk? Oh, God. Sometimes can, and especially with people I coach also. And then sometimes even after. So I'm wondering oh, yes. you know, when, yes. when your critic comes up before, during, or after, and then how you deal with that critic in those different those different times. Well, everyone has a critic. There's no criticectomy. There is no removing the critic from yourself or the process. But you can decide when to give it airtime. 
And right before I go on stage is not the time because I have to walk on there knowing I have something to say. And if someone paid me to be there, which is usually the case, they have invested in me and I trust them and their audience. And this is what I'm here to do. It's a job. So I'm like, I need to make sure I deliver on that. So I don't have time. I, I treat the critic the way I do people who annoy me. I simply do not have time for the critic. My critic will come up when I'm creating the talk. And right before, I'll be like, oh, is this enough? Is this too fluffy? Is this enough? Uh, and I get like all crazy about it. And then when I get there, I go, oh my God, it was fine. You know? And so, like you said, people go, oh my God, my voice, my this. The things that make you a little different, right? Because no one wants to see the same speaker over and over again, right? Everyone is different. And whether, regardless of what your quirks are, um, it can be really appealing and humanizing. So rather than you know, beat yourself up for all the little things that make you quirky or different. I, when I said lean into what you're good at, no one, if you have quirky hand gestures, that might be kind of fun. So I just, I limit how much access the critic has to me. So before, during the content creation is when I worry. When I'm on there, no time. And then when I get off stage, it's done. But you didn't say this part. No one cares. If you leave a paragraph or a page out, no one knows it but you, and literally no one cares. So I try to just practice ignoring it as much as I can. That's what has worked for me. But also remember, I'm trained in a method that has taught me to put the critic in its place, because otherwise I wouldn't make anything. I wouldn't speak anywhere right. and I wouldn't do anything. Yeah. Are you talking about the gateless writing yeah. method? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a method I learned, you know, almost a decade ago and I'm certified in. It's it's a it's a simple approach, simple but not easy approach where you create first. You do not go, will everyone like this? Is this a good talk? Is that a good talk? No, we don't have time. We just fill the space with the creating and the writing and the talking. And then we go in and say, okay, what could be made stronger? Is this too long? What about this? Calling on the pragmatist to help get a piece ready for the stage versus oh, but you're annoying and you never do this well. And da, da. I just, again, a lot of the gateless method is, uh, well, we don't allow criticism or judgment in the room when we're working workshop style, which is how I teach it. And, you know, we, we squeeze it out a bit. So there's not as much place, especially when you're doing the very, um, you know, heavy lift of creating the message. Right, right. The other thing I got from reading a little bit about it was it seemed like so often we're like, well, let's look at the problems and fix those rather than let's, let's look at what's good. And let yes. that, let that, that is the challenge because we can pick stuff apart all day, but we yeah. don't take time. It's like, I think of as biceps and triceps, like you'll strengthen the bicep of criticism and, and deconstructing and fixing all the time. But then what happens to the tricep? The tricep is the longest muscle in your arm. It's what it gives your arm definition. If you ignore that, you do not build strength. And so when we look at the work and the writing, we say, okay, they deliver something. They Maybe they practice delivering the intro or whatever. I'll say, here's what I loved about it. And it's not, you're so awesome, Jill. We loved that. And it, no, it's more like about craft. The This kind of feedback focuses on, here's what worked. I love this. I love this. I love this. Now, how do you feel about it? Well, I felt a little about this part. Okay, why? Did you feel it was dragging? What can What might you do to change it? So it always gives power back to the person who created it, whether a speaker, writer, candlestick maker, right? That they get that. to be the person rather than here's what you should do. Cause I, of course I'm tempted to be like, do this, do this. I will say, I think if you want to do this and you want to have this effect, here's one idea you could use if you wanted. So it's always on the person to decide their creative, take creative agency. Part of that method just reminds me so much of, do you know the Alexander technique at all? I have, yes. I remember yeah. studying that a little bit when I was an editor. I have an Alexander technique teacher and she would have us ask ourselves this question of rather than oh where you know where do you feel tension and try to let, let that go rather than doing that she'd say where do you feel a bit easy and it's like oh I feel a bit easy maybe it's just in your pinky but then it can expand from there rather than isn't that great it's sort of like I a body version love of that. that it is I actually didn't yeah. know that part of it yeah. That that is exactly it. If we think about pain, we when we think about problems, you you know it just gets bigger and takes over. And also, there's right. you're never going to run out of flaws to pick at. That's a, how much time do you have in your life? Would you rather spend them doing that? Because if you want ease, and I, I don't know about you, I like ease. I like ease and flow. 
And I'd rather just do that. When I write a thing, it doesn't matter, talk, an article, whatever. And I'll go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love this part. I love this part. So I'm forever teaching people, take the stuff you love, move it up the page and don't delete anything. Just drop the rest of the stuff down so that you're continually doing this. You're bringing the good stuff up and moving the other stuff down saying, no, 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 I just don't need you right now. And then by the end, you've pulled up the best stuff and then you're out of space and you're only going to use this much. But focusing on what you love helps you get how else are you going to be excited about going up there and speaking if you're not in love with the message? It's really true. That's so great. I have a funny question for you. If you had a choice, would you rather present to a room full of strangers or a room full of your peers, people that you know? That's a really good question. I assume that people would say peers, but actually maybe not. Um, what would I do? <sighs> I think that it's easier to speak in front of strangers because there's nothing, you know, you're not, it doesn't have any capital. Like if you're being paid to speak in front of people, they don't like you, it doesn't matter. Whereas there's more weight in the room if you care about what those people think about you tomorrow. And so because I enjoy the speaking so much, I actually get a real rush out of presenting to the people that I know because that's fun and because I like them. But I guess if you were in a very competitive industry and everyone was like trying to knock you down a peg, that would not be great. Uh, but you know, give me a room full of people. I'm usually pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think most people I would rather speak to who I, this is a very unscientific survey, survey that I'm doing. <laughs> they, would, they would rather speak to strangers rather than peers. I think yeah. peers are harder. Because also you're changing. It's like suddenly you're, you know, for that moment, you're queen or king for the day. You know right. what I mean? You So you're suddenly like, what do you mean she's in charge? What do you mean they're in charge? You know? Yeah, uh, there's a need to maybe be more self-deprecating in front of peers. Right. Especially right. if you're speaking, whereas in the audience, you know, maybe with that you don't know. Yeah. You know. They expect you, know you to funny? be the leader. <laughs> when people say... They tell me, oh, well, I could speak in front of like 50 people, but I would die if I were in front of 200 people. And I was like, do you know how many people are in a room? Like, so if it reaches 199, you're still okay. And then at 200, you lose everything, control of your words, everything. Like this idea, this fiction of numbers of how many people um, will, will change how you are. I just think that's not exactly true. I think that's a thing we make up. It's in your head. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything ever happened to you on stage that was just completely humiliating? <laughs> and how did you get through it? Can you think of anything? Well, it's always like tech stuff. And and it's no, it's like it's never your fault when it's tech stuff that happens, and yet you're trying to get through it. Okay. So there's one, just last week I was presenting to a group of like maybe 150 people and the thing, oh no, 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 this was the keynote. This was like a bigger group and, and the slides started blinking out and I was like, oh God, now the slides are, cause now it's a distraction. And while the slides are a great way for, great way for people to absorb the content. And I actually said to them, is this a distraction? Cause I can just turn it off you know, and they said, well, no, no, we want to see it. And then finally it kind of settled out, but I was annoyed because I was being upstaged by the slides. And I think that's the worst thing ever. Slides should not be taking attention away. But I'll tell you that once I was at a breakfast with like a couple hundred people, it was this huge breakfast somewhere in Texas where everything's huge. And my mic didn't work. And it was like, uh, 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 like, it just wasn't working. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, all I need is a hot mic. Like that's all I need. I don't even need the slides. Right. And they had come up and fixed it and then it kept happening. And I, and then you're caught because now you're losing time and everyone's looking at you in the audience, no one's saying anything. And I was like, okay, let's try this again. I was like, guys, can we uh, fix it? You know, I'm kind of like calling out those guys who they do not want to be seen right there behind the table. Like, don't look at us. So they come up and there's this awkward moment of total silence where they're getting me the new mic and I, my talk has totally come to a standstill. And I looked at the front table and I looked at a guy there and I go, so what do you do? And the whole place <laughs> cracked up and I was like, that saved me. That's comedic timing. It saved me. And you know what I mean? Like that in the moment, I was like, what do you do? You have to make a joke about this. And so then I, it filled up a moment and got people back. And it's like, you got to win them back. 
So that was kind of a, uh, but everything will go wrong. Your slides will go wrong. You might go wrong. You have to say to yourself, it's what I tell myself, if everything were to go wrong and you had to shout at the top of your lungs with no slides, could you do it? And the fact is you could, you just think you couldn't. And that's, you can't have, you can't, if you have a half hour to present, you can't spend 10 minutes of it trying to fix the slides. They don't matter. It doesn't matter. You have something to say. Okay, wait, I thought of another one. I just, um, well, I, but I want to call out what you did. What's that? Right. Was on the first example, you asked the audience, first of all, you acknowledged the mishap. Mm -hmm. Then you said to the audience, you know, I, if you like something happens on the stage, what sometimes people's first response is, is to ignore it. But the thing is, if you spill the glass of water, you cannot ignore it because everyone's That's looking an opportunity. At the water. <laughs> yes, exactly. Then the second example, that's just, I mean, besides acknowledging it, and you know what, the great thing is you made it the problem of the tech people, and it was their problem in that moment. You sat there with the discomfort, and then just Terry, wait. that was just completely inspired. I mean, you know, you're standing there, he's standing there. In a way, what you did is what comes naturally. You're standing with somebody, you're waiting, and you say, so what do you do? I mean, that yeah, that's it. So but you have to be like, it's almost like you need to drop into the reality of the situation to People have your People want brain. to see you. They don't yes. want to see something perfect. They'd love to see something happen. Uh, last year when I had a keynote at this big design event that I speak at every year, this was my big year because my book had just come out. And the woman I've known for years is going to introduce me. She got taken over by a coughing fit so badly. And I was like, is she okay? And then she's like, eh, eh. She was coughing so bad. And I was like standing at the edge of the stage, like, what do I do? And she goes, e here's Terry. I didn't get the intro. I didn't get anything. She had a whole intro written. She's like, here's Terry. And I walked on as she hacked her lung up as she's walking off stage. And I walked on and I was like, hey, I guess I really don't need any introduction. You're like, that's it. Here I am. I, we have no, this is not going as planned. I think those are the moments you can win the audience if you just acknowledge it. And go, oh well. But if you ignore it, then we know there's there's tension in the room because you have not acknowledged the thing that we all know happened, and now we don't trust that you're in the right. same re right. reality. Right. You become with us. very untrustworthy. That's that's great. Yes. So yeah. 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 I want to know those first few minutes before you walk on a stage, what are you know, you're re prepped, you are ready, lipsticks checked, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing in those five minutes before you walk on? What are you feeling and what are you doing? I'm floating. I'm hovering a few inches above the ground. I think it's the most exciting moment ever, you know, and I, I hold on to it because even for a professional speaker, the number of hours you will be on a stage over the course of your life is minuscule, right? Compared to the hours I stand unloading laundry, waiting in line, like, that, that is a precious, a sacred moment. Because why? The moment is filled with meaning. It's high stakes. It's time slows down. And when you're out there, when you're about to go out there, you do not have, the, you cannot be thinking about other things. You have what I think of is the luxury of focus. There's no other time in my day where I have that kind of focus. And when you're there, you're kind of safe in this sort of talk bubble where this is what's happening right now. And so right before I go on stage, I'm standing off stage. I'm holding my mic because I always use a handheld. I hate lapel mics. They are the worst. They're hitting your necklace, your blouse. No one can hear you. I want that sucker right up in my face. And so I'm holding the mic and I'm excited. And then when I walk out, this is going to sound so incredibly corny, but I'm going to say it. I feel like, like an incredible sense of love love and gratitude for the ability to do it, yes, but just like positive vibes. Like I, I, maybe someday something will be negative vibes when I walk out, but it just feels like what an honor and a privilege to be able to come out and hold people's attention and give them something to walk away with that they didn't walk in with. That is a privilege. It is a gift. And so I don't take it lightly at all. Wow. You have just done a gorgeous reframe for me, Terry. Because I find that I can find the first five minutes before I get out there just, I, I just, it's funny. I feel if I just reframe how, how I label it, I could experience it like you just. Well, what said. do you experience? You're a seasoned performer. 
I feel it all coming and I do feel like I'm writing something, but um, I think what I, I don't do, but I'm going to do now is relax, not, not like relax, but just accept it in the moment for what it is. It's almost like what the image I had when you were describing your experience was that I was that, that moment before the rocket takes off. Yes. And all that is building and you're just mm-hmm. about to take off. Yes. And, um, yeah. So the engine's I, I, going. I, the engine's right. going. The engine, before you take off, yes. you can the feel it. Going. Some people think it's you can. nerves or anxiety. I think of it as a, a dre- sure, a little adrenaline, right? But yeah. also there's yeah. energy coursing through you. I feel like I yeah. could do, I could lift a car in that moment. Like <laughs> there's a kind of capability that comes through us that you really don't usually find in yourself at three o'clock on a Sunday, but there mm. you're at your best because you're pulling on all cylinders and, and it's kind of it's a pregnant moment, right? It's a loaded moment before you step out there. And so I try to like soak it up for all that it is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like roller coasters. I do not like rides. I do not like Disney World. Even the babiest of rides I am afraid of. I don't either. I don't either. This is our roller coaster. This is it. And, and I was sitting there with my friend and I was about to go up and she goes, you realize that like, you're afraid to, to do this and that and the other thing. And most people are would rather do any of it than do what you're about to do right now. I was like, more people ride roller coasters. I don't know how they do it. But this is the roller coaster, except when you step out on that stage, you have an idea of what will happen, but you don't really know. And that, if that isn't adventure, I don't know what is. That's beautiful. Any speakers you admire or people you just love listening to, whether it's a stand-up comedian or some other speaker speaker? Oh, I love the comedians. I do love the concept. I think, oh, I was watching a special by uh, with Nate Bergazzi, who is just like the most average white man you've ever seen. He His whole jam is the average white man. And if you watch it, you'll say, this doesn't look hard. But that's where the craftsmanship comes in. We don't think of comics as public speakers, but they are doing a ton of heavy lifting in a very short time. You know, even the hour long special, you know, you're watching them create the story. You have shared jokes with the audience that now they feel they're in on the timing, the pacing and the fact that it looks like they're just talking. It's a conversation. Uh, the thing that drives me nuts is when I, it's almost hard for me to watch speakers sometimes at events. It's kind of like, ah, gah, 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 because they go up and they're like, uh, let me start by introducing myself. Like they do this odd talking. I'm giving a talk now. I'm like, why are you doing that? I think it could be a very intimate sounding situation. And so I'm like, oh, so there's, you know, I mean, we all love the same. The people who have made history of the most watched TED Talks of all time. I love all of them too. Um, but the comics are probably the type of public speaking we take in the most. And uh, if you're a speaker, watch them. Note, how often are the jokes hitting? How often? It's usually every 20 seconds. You get every 20 seconds, three laughs a minute. Um, you know, really study it. What are they saying? What are they doing? Because if you were to copy that model and add in your content, you don't have to be funny, but the model of it would provide excellent structure. And I do try to copy that. I use that thing, like, where's the setup? Where's the payoff? You know, That's great. It matters. You just you just reminded me. I want to ask you something about the microphone. Oh yes, I, I love know my you microphone. just you just said well, not your microphone right now, but a handheld <laughs> versus the lav. Yes, versus the lav. The only thing about the handheld is then you don't have both your hands. And I, I think in the who's missing talk, both you- hands? Who needs both hands? <laughs> who's like you know what? It would have been great if she'd used both hands. I miss both hands. <laughs> she only went with the left. It was a real bummer. You actually can be very expressive. What about people who literally don't have one hand? They can't be as good? <laughs> nope. That's not true at all. So uh, trust that the people who have uh, lapel uh, mics, they're not like usually, oh, what they were dynamic. They just happen to be wearing a clip on mic that doesn't work as well. I'll tell you why I like the handheld. It's because you can control. If you want to say something loud, you pull it away from you like this, and then you can come in real close, and that's how you get the laughs. So yeah, I want to yeah. control and modulate the sound. So when I say something, uh, like if people, if I say something and I, no one laughs, I can go, okay, well, it was funny when I wrote it. 
Like that's, that'll get the laugh, but you can only, you're like pulling their yeah. ear closer. You have more control. I have a I mic that. in one hand and a clicker in the other. And there's no one who would watch me and go, yeah, she got to lose those things. I don't even know what she's saying. I don't even, she's so boring because yeah, you don't yeah. need both hands. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, this has been, Terry, incredible. A couple last little things before we say goodbye today. Are there any particular, we've talked about so many things, but are there any particular resources you, you like that, to, to recommend for people? I mean, you've mentioned watching comedians, et cetera. Any, any just other book or books you've read that have been just super inspiring or just any other resources you want about to recommend About speaking specifically? <laughs> About speaking, speaking or about specific. life or about, uh, I feel like life and speaking are so, are so close. They're so similar. Yes. Uh, well, you know, when I, I did really like Chris Anderson's famous book, Ted Talks, The Official Guide to Public Speaking, because what he's talking about in that book is really what we should be worried about. And it doesn't start with delivery. It's about what are you really saying? What is the idea you're offering? And when I, I had already been thinking along those lines, but I hadn't codified it like that. And then when I read his book, I was like, oh my God, I must be on the right track because this is exactly what I thought. And he's backing it up and he's the big guy at TEDx or at TED rather. So uh, I do recommend that as a book, but I think it's kind of like when it comes to speaking, it's like reading a book on surfing. Like you're not going to get better until you get up on that board and yeah, you will learn yeah. so much from yourself by doing things and watching yourself and even doing virtual, look, we're doing virtual presentations now, right? You can always yeah. watch those again and be like, well, what am I doing? Where do I feel ease? And where are my, and I don't say problems. I tell people, where do you feel friction? If they say, I, I, I go, it's not like, oh, that's a bad story. Leave it out. I go, where do you feel friction? Well, I, I slow down around this idea because I, I go, take it out or mm -hmm. let's comb through it. So I do think that that is a, is a helpful tool. But yes, in terms of books and resources, I love that. I think reading in general is critical. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you read Chris Anderson's book when you were uh, working on your TEDx? Oh my no. God, no, no. And what I had read was another TED book that basically told me I'd have to be a NASA scientist to give a TED talk. And I was like, forget it. I'm not reading this book. Forget it. I'll never give a talk. So I... I I just was very intimidated. And so I didn't know that you didn't have to be a really big deal in order to give one, and especially now. How did you get from very intimidated to doing the talk that now has 8 million views? Because uh, I had been doing some speaking and posting about it, you know, and some person I don't even know personally reached out and said, hey, I work for the company that hosts the TEDx in Kansas City. You look like someone who'd be great at that. We do not know each other. Do you want to be connected? And I said, yes, please. And I got on a call with the producer that day and he was very leery of me because he said, I see you're a consultant and they're always afraid of consultants. They're afraid they're going to push their stuff and talk about their stuff. And I was like, Oh, yeah, but let's talk about the idea. You know, he said, what ideas do you have? So I started spitballing. I did not have an idea. I was not talking about this. Yeah, I threw a few on the table and he said, hmm, the passion thing's really interesting. And he was just really brilliant. He helped edit the talk and helped me find the thing. And so when it succeeded and, and got a bunch of views, he wasn't surprised, but I mean, I was. I was very surprised uh, wow. because it wasn't people like, oh, did you always believe this? And you gave it to talk about it. I was like, no, I didn't figure out what I thought until I wrote the talk. I was writing the talk going, well, what is the answer? I don't know. Let's write our way into it. Writing is the way in. It's how you figure everything out. You think you're going to figure out your talk and then write it down? That's not how it works. You need to write it. I thought of another resource though. I use oh, words to time.com. Words, the word to, T O, time. Words to time.com. It's just this free resource, and I use it to remind myself of how many minutes it will take to read how many words. So when I teach people in my little showcase, I say, it, you, Your talk should be about eight minutes. It should be well under 10 minutes, and that's about 1,200 words. So if you have 1,500 words, that's nah, not going to work. So it's just a good rule of thumb when you're trying to figure out how long something can or should be. That's great. Let us know how to contact you and also how to find your book. Find it wherever books are sold, uh, Barnes and Noble, but also you can go to unfollowyourpassion.com and I have all the different links to different, you know, if you're an indie bookstore person, all that. Uh, but I do want to extend the offer of this brand new thing 
that helps people with the emotional and mental part of standing up to do something, speaking anything else. And it's called The Passion Trap, Five Half Truths Keeping You From Living a Full Life. And it basically takes to task in the spirit of the TED Talk, talent, confidence, motivation, authority, all the things you think you need to do what you most want to do and why they're not true at all. Uh, and so that that's a, a small free video course, and I just did it. So I just want to share it. And it's just terrygpisha.com slash trap. Great. Fantastic. Terry, it has been beyond a pleasure to talk to you. It is always so always much fun. fun to talk I to you. I think you are so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you. you so, so, so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Bye for now. 